recording. And Kate, would you like to say a few words of welcome on behalf of WSTN? Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Alicia. We so appreciate you speaking today, but also your flexibility and willingness to help host this workshop via the online virtual platform. Good morning to everyone who's in attendance. Um, this is our very first virtual education session that we have tried with WSPN. As many of you know, we try to offer seven to eight education mm -hmm. sessions each year. Um, typically, they're in person, but obviously, we are, like everyone else, are working to be flexible and move um, to meet everyone's needs. The organization and the board have worked really hard to try and put as many resources as we can together on our website. Articles we're seeing, resources we're seeing to help all of you to navigate these new waters and to be as agile as we need to be, to use all the buzzwords that are out there right now. I think I missed pivot, right? Don't we say pivot now all the time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I am honored to serve as the president of WSPN this year. We are currently anticipating hosting our June session, still determining whether that will be virtual or in person. More to come on that. If you ever have any questions or see resources that you love, Please be sure to share those with us via email. Um, our information is on the WSPNonline.org website. And uh, I think that probably covers everything. We did move our luncheon, which is typically in May, to the fall in August. We hope to see you all there because we want to celebrate the honorees that are being recognized this year. So please be sure, again, just to watch the website and the newsletters for information. That's probably more than enough. I'm thrilled to hear from Dr. Alicia today. She's a fantastic presenter and has such a great, unique perspective on nonprofits. Um, does a lot of work with NIU in partnership with Giving DuPage and the Civic Leadership Academy that she mentioned those courses for, um, which is where I first met her. And she does an amazing job of covering some of these topics. So I think this is incredibly relevant today. We couldn't have known when we scheduled it months ago how relevant it would be. Um, but I think that it does fit in very well with what's going on now and allows us to kind of look at the bigger picture pieces, which I think a lot of us get busy down in the muck and don't always do that. So I know I'm guilty of that. Um, but again, thank you, Dr. Alicia. Thank you so much to all of you for attending today and more to come. Thanks, Kate. Thank you so much. And I, I wish I was in person. I certainly like doing a lot of these in-person um, activities. So, but you know what? It's uh, everybody has to learn new skills and and sharpen our skills. And it's interesting to come uh, come to you virtually this morning. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to give you for those of you who don't know me, I'll give you a couple things about my background, and then we're going to jump right in because I know uh, we've scheduled from 8:30 to 10. I love this stuff. I live and breathe it, so I could really talk for hours. Um, I often joke we have three-hour graduate courses, up to five-hour graduate courses, so believe me, I have some stamina when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, by way of introductions, okay, so I got a couple of um, notes if you can't hear audio. So yes, we are, we are recording, so if you do run into audio issues or connection issues, know that you will get the recording afterwards. Um, so originally I'm from Ontario, Canada, um, moved to the United States, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then in 2010, um, moved out here to Illinois. So I have about 10 years of public and nonprofit experience before I went back to school and I was an executive director for four years. Um, so I could empathize with all of you who uh, are in the trenches. Um, I, it was a very, very challenging, hard job um, to do that. And uh, I went back to school. I thought it'd be easier and in many ways it is. And in some ways it's a little bit, I'll say different. <laughs> So I've been uh, faculty at NIU since 2010. I'm the acting director of the Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies. We have an undergraduate degree in nonprofit and NGO studies, and I also teach in our MPA program. So if you have any questions about that, please reach out to me. Um, you can also connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and I have a podcast, All Things Local. If you're interested in, in listening to um, a bunch of people who are doing things on the ground level, um, uh, the podcast is kind of interesting. I've been interviewing a lot of different people um, over the, I think I'm up to 10 or 11 episodes now. So if you're interested in podcasts and we're all hunkered down, take a listen. Um, so the agenda is really, um, and this topic is one that's been kind of percolating for many years. For me, I had a chance to kind of preview it up in Rockford talking to their AFP chapter. Um, kind of uh, our current landscape of how we got here when it comes to focusing on our mission and the value that we bring um, and where I think there's a path forward, what we need to do to do that, and then some key takeaways as we uh, as we kind of wrap up. So as I said, I'm going to try to leave questions to the end unless there's, uh, you know, a really important question. Kate's going to be monitoring the chat. Um, Julianne O'Connell, who's my assistant director in the center, she's on here. So if you see her name up there, 
um, she's on here and she will also help me ding me if I need to stop and and kind of note something if I miss it okay so current landscape um, and you guys are in the nonprofit world so I won't spend a whole lot of time on what this looks like but I think there's some really key things we need to think about as it relates to mission and demonstrating our relevance um, and this is even more important today so in the nonprofit space, um, we use a number of different words. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, I think, in the public about what these things mean. Sometimes our policymakers, our legislation, our legislators, um, the people that uh, business sector, everybody, um, we, we throw all these different words around, and yet we don't have very clear definitions on what they are because we have uh, the words nonprofit organization, charitable organization are often used in statutes, like the um, IRS regulations, for example example referring to nonprofit organizations within the tax code so that's kind of one definition but then you have the Secretary of State and the Attorney General for the state of Illinois referring to charitable organizations we have non for profit not for profit um, non-governmental organizations so it does add to confusion within the sector when you say the word business there's a there's a you know an easy kind of thing that comes to mind what they're doing but when you say the word nonprofit we get into this very confusing kind of landscape and that's just the reality of how the sector has evolved so this word like charity I don't use it very often I try not to use it very often um, we still need charities uh, there are still organizations that exist exist purely to serve a lot of them are mission-based many of them are faith-based um, so there will always be a certain uh, portion of the nonprofit sectors that I would consider more charities, but as a whole, I think we have moved away from a lot of that kind of terminology. Um, as I said, related to charity, where we have people giving things, donations. Uh, this is an example of, of food drives that are going on right now. Um, but we do know if you run a food organization, a food distribution organization, sometimes food drives are not actually very efficient. <laughs> they might raise awareness of a cause, and that's important. Um, but they're not great ways to actually um, purchase food, to get food out to people who need it. Um, maybe it's not the right food. Maybe it's expired food. Um, maybe it's really not meeting the cultural needs of the populations that you serve. So we also have to be aware of those kinds of things. As I mentioned, we have charities. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul is just one of them with all, mostly all volunteer gathering, donations, and then distributing it back out into the public. So there's a definite need for that charity part of the nonprofit sector. But for most of us, that is not um, who we are representing. The number of nonprofits has really um, increased over time. This is just from 1970, where we have um, large growth in the number of nonprofits. Now, our population continues to go up as well. So you would also see the same kind of trajectory when you look at for-profit um, businesses as well. So this isn't uncommon. Sometimes I'll run into people that say, oh, there are too many nonprofits. Um, we have enough, those kinds of words. Um, and I think those, they refer to numbers because we don't give them a lot of great information about what we're actually doing and the impact that we're having. So they refer to these kind of simplistic charts of there's, there's just too many nonprofits. Um, or there's overlap in services. That's another one that I often hear. So we already have, you know, we already have a counseling service. Why do we need three more? Well, we don't ask that when a restaurant opens and there's a restaurant right across the street. So why do we have that same kind of um, reaction when you talk about the nonprofit sector? So kind of then thinking through um, where the contributions go, this has been pretty stable over the years. Um, as you look at more recent statistics and, and statistics that are even, um, you know, several years old, religion still comes up as a third of all contributions are going into religion or faith-based organizations. Um, and this may decline over time, uh, but we still see it holding fairly steady. Um, human services and education, bigger chunk, and then you have very small, pieces of this pie like arts, culture, humanities, environment, um, and international work. So if you're in the, any of those spaces, you know that a lot of the contributions that are coming into the sector are not going particularly to your um, interests. And then kind of a, a second challenge is around this idea of nonprofit sustainability. And I again, if you know me, you probably know That's I don't like a lot of those words. Um, when you think about the funding models, we have to also uh, keep in mind that there's this double bottom line expectation. We have this financial efficiency married with this program effectiveness. And the, the public, our donors, our funders, government, wants us to be as financially efficient as possible. Um, so are we getting enough return? Um, are we squeezing the, the most amount of dollars out? And every nonprofit person that I've ever run to, efficiency is never <laughs> usually their problem. They are maximizing resources everywhere. They are stretching uh, resources. So 
combining job descriptions. Uh, when I was working in the nonprofit sector, you get these very elaborate titles that sound wonderful, but it's a way to, again, use one individual to do a number of different jobs and positions within the organization. Um, at the same time as we're trying to be really efficient in managing all those resources, we have to also be concerned about program effectiveness. So are we meeting those uh, missions that we established? Do we, are we having an impact on that mission? And then how do you measure those things? And that's a real uh, struggle for nonprofit organizations to balance those things, if it's even possible. Related to that is that the revenue that we have coming in is really diverse into the sector. So if you look at the for-profit sector, you might have sales as really their primary um, way to earn revenue. If you look at nonprofit revenue, these are just some examples of all the different revenue streams that nonprofits avail themselves of. And there's other things that we have to consider because all revenue is not equal. You have um, the, the notion of how predictable is that. We're in a situation right now in, in this current crisis um, where you might say, well, individual contributions are actually very, very predictable because if you're in a, a very public serving organization right now, the public facing, you're serving individuals, maybe food distribution, or you're providing um, senior care, those kinds of things, your individual grants might be, or your individual donations might be fairly predictable. Um, they also give you high autonomy, potentially. Um, on the reverse, you might have government contracts. And the predictability, potentially, if you're a state uh, subcontractor, for example, fairly predictable if you're in health and human services that you're going to receive that contract each year if you go through the procedural accountability of filing things when you're supposed to file things. Um, but you might have low to moderate autonomy. There's Sometimes there's very little you can actually do to spend those dollars outside of that original grant contribution. So there are lots of reasons why you can't spend money within nonprofits, and this will often drive the CFOs or chief financial officers crazy because they might look to say, well, you just got a half million dollar grant, except I actually can't spend any of that money because that's been earmarked for um, a particular program activity and that you're not allowed to spend those dollars in other areas what you, where you might have need. So when you think of, if you're reading those contracts that you get from government, and if you're, if you're those organizations that pursue government funding, there's there's a lot of list of things that you cannot spend money on. So you can't use funds for uh, you know non-program staff, or you can't use funds to purchase IT equipment, whatever it happens to be. So lots of restrictions on those. And this all kind of started this whole accountability movement, um, and I'll discuss this briefly around starvation cycle. Really started in the late 80s and early 90s. This was hitting the public sector as well. The public was calling for more accountability when you um, for nonprofits, but also government. And so what we started to see was um, a perception, real or not, of organizations starving their administrative costs, their, their overhead costs, their non-program costs. Um, and I'll, I'll say kind of uh, what, what has resulted because of that. But really, I wanted you to, to be clear why this whole thing started, because we thought or the public really pushed government and, and pushed foundations and, and larger donors to really say we want nonprofits to be more accountable um, with the dollars that they're getting with their tax advantage status that they have. And I'm not arguing that they don't need to be accountable, but I want you to recognize that that was really um, that really kicked off this whole notion of, of starvation and this overhead um, pushback. So this starvation cycle was talked about in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, and it's a, it's a good publication for those of you who've ever picked it up or had a read. Um, and it's this whole cycle of nonprofits do less with less, and so they continue to be able to do less with less. They underfund in many things that you would consider administrative costs. And so the next time they go for funding, their funding might be reduced even further. And again, they're able to um, still do the same amount of programming or maybe somewhat less programming um, with this whole underinvestment of uh, administrative costs. So the other thing to mention, and if you're in the development world, and I, I love these cartoons sometimes to throw them into webinars, um, if, you're, if you're a development director, you're working in a fundraising area, um, which most of you are probably in, I sometimes will hear organizations, you know, well, we're coming up short, and this is, you might be facing a lot of this pressure right now going through the nuclear crisis. If you're coming up short, fundraising is often look, well, that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to close the gap. So I'm just going to take a drink here. So we're going to look at fundraising as really the gap filler, for lack of a better word. Um, we're not going to think more strategic about why those things are happening or plan accordingly. 
some of my MPA students who have gone into nonprofit organizations, fundraising is sometimes um, looked at as a bank. Um, so if we want to do all these things, now fundraisers go find the money to do it. Um, and it, there's a separation between what the organization really needs to grow and sustain itself versus what the capacity of the organization really is when it comes to fundraising and what your donor base you know, actually looks like. Grants are a whole other area. We teach about grants in our undergraduate as well as our graduate program. And so if you're pursuing grants, um, you know that grants are, are not just writing the grant. There's a lot of, there's a lot of critical steps that go into um, getting a grant, pursuing a grant, um, the grant proposal, gathering data, putting together budgets. But even then when you get the grant, um, then you have to submit all of the um, financial information, the reporting information, um, work with accounting, monitor that, close out the grant. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens pre-award and post-award, particularly if you're running multiple grants. Um, grants are very common and, and work more common, and now they've gone more to contracts when it comes to government, which creates a whole cash flow issue for sure. But any, any time when you're dealing with grants, there's a lot of strings that come with grants, a lot of time that goes into grants that is not really captured in the actual um, award because again grants management falls under an administrative or potentially a fundraising expense which doesn't include um, which doesn't really account for some of the program grants that you're getting so in when the last state, state budget crisis hit um, a couple of years ago and and now looking at this current crisis that we're in this also this often seems like a, a little prelude to what we're experiencing right now except this one lasted two years uh, the state budget crisis and the one we're currently in um, we were immediately cast into a crisis within a couple of days so very different in terms of how we got into it but it, it is similar in that i'm curious how nonprofits are responding we see everything right now um, from organizations are dipping into reserves, um, organizations that are pivoting their in-person fundraising events to virtual. Um, we see furloughs, we see uh, across the board pay cuts, um, we see reductions in programs. I don't know how many will actually result in closures. That, that's going to take a little budget, bit of time to figure that out as, as they go. But I do know in the state budget crisis, um, very few nonprofit organizations actually closed. Um, they might be in a worse financial position than they were before, but they did not close, or very few. We did see a couple of mergers during the state budget crisis or the fallout from that, so I'm curious if that will actually happen in this kind of crisis. So this pandemic crisis that we're currently in has really um, highlighted how nonprofits, what they learned the last time we went through um, a smaller crisis like the, like the state budget crisis, what did they learn going through that and how are they able then to pivot, um, for lack of a better word, when Kate mentioned that in the beginning, um, into this new arena that we're in. How are they able to talk about their missions? How are they able to be really strategic about what they're doing and make those calculated decisions um, and mainly this is going to be board leadership to see if they're able to do that. So when you think about, you know, the, the missions of the organization, one way to try to, to fund your administrative costs to run your organizations is by applying indirect costs. And indirect costs are anything that is not directly related to program service delivery. So um, I would challenge you to think about what are your indirect costs for every program? That should be what are, not what is. <laughs> Um, what are your indirect costs for every program that you run? What does it cost to put together that after school program? What does it cost um, to run your summer camp? What does it cost to provide your swim lessons? You know, whatever it happens to be. Um, and your indirect costs are everything that are not captured in, in program service delivery. So yes, you need staff to deliver those programs, but what about your insurance? Um, what about the maintenance of those buildings? Um, what amount of staff time, support staff time that goes into um, getting your technology? What kind of marketing materials did you have to create for that? What, what's your website maintenance um, cost? Those kinds of things. So all of those indirect costs go together. I will tell you, working at a state university, uh, we try to capture, or we um, request to capture where we can, 47% indirect costs for every grant that we submit. Now, 47% will often not get that, but that's, that's where we start because once you factor in um, use of the buildings, telephone lines, internet connections, library access, offices, uh, laptops, whatever it happens to be, um, the university has determined that 47% is the true cost of, of providing a lot of what we do um, that's not directly related to any particular project. So this chart just shows that um, you have variance between local, state, and federal 
when it comes to what indirect costs are. And the majority, um, you know, it looks like probably 90% of all the funders here are really paying less than 15% in indirect costs if you're getting anything. Um, zero to three percent, you know, we have about 30% of the federal government is paying that up to 33% for state government and 37% of local government. So um, uh, about a third of all governments are actually paying less than 3% of your administrative costs or your indirect costs. And that's a problem. Um, and you know this is a problem because when you take those state contracts or government contracts at all, you know they're never going to cover the cost of actually delivering those services. Um, because if they could, the government would do it themselves. And a lot of times we have nonprofits who um, who agree to these terms. It's, it's a contract. You agree to these terms up front. And because of that, you have to supplement those contracts with fundraising uh, and with use of volunteers. That's the only way to make that work. The other thing that you're able to make that work is you pay your staff less. Um, you have less benefits, you have less salaries, um, you don't have the best equipment, you don't have things that are maybe up to date, you're not investing in professional development, whatever you do. Um, so you need to be aware of what those indirect costs are for, by program if possible, so that when you agree to take certain grants or certain um, contracts, you understand the difference between what is being funded and what you're, you as an organization are going to have to raise um, or squeeze resources from somewhere else, whether that's coming in from staff salaries um, or whether that's coming in from volunteers. You're going to have to cover that difference. But I think bringing awareness of what it actually costs um, to, to run all of your programs and not just at a pure program break-even point, but covering some of those indirect costs so that you can um, you know, sustain the organization and grow the organization where you need to. So how often do funders um, cover the full pro cost of the programs they support? So this is another kind of a different way to look at um, when you think of the full cost of, of your programs is you look at local government, state government, and federal government. So um, if you look at the government side of this, about half never cover the full cost of the programs they intend to support. Um, about 25% of foundations never cover those and about 30% for individuals um, looking at major donors. However, if you look at how much full cost of programs are, they intend to support um, in the always category, the highest is individuals. I mean, individuals are where you have the most success of explaining what you do, why you do it, and the true cost of what it covers, uh, what you need to cover those programs. So if you rely heavily on individuals, this is going to be an easier conversation potentially than when you're working in government where you can see that governments are really not interested um, in covering those full costs because, again, if they could do it for the same amount of money, they would just do it themselves. They're, they're partnering with nonprofit organizations because they, they there is an efficiency there. They are reducing their direct costs by contracting with you or granting with a nonprofit organizations to pay for those services at a lower price. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times nonprofits rely on those funds, so they're willing to accept those lower, um, those lower amounts. So if you think about um, the reporting requirements in relation to funding amounts, so if you, I'm sure for many of you that are fundraisers on this call, if you've received government funds, you know that the reporting requirements are uh, are incredible, um, time consuming, um, detailed, um, you need a lot of finance support, you're running Excel spreadsheets to try to figure this stuff out, you're doing this regularly. I jokingly, I did a workshop a couple of months ago um, and I was joking that I got a CDBG grant. So for those of you who ever gotten um, CDBG funding for uh, this particular project was an accessible bathroom and I think it was for $5,000 um, and I had to report on that for a year I had to collect demographic information for everyone who had visited our site. We ran a, a museum at the time. That was the worst $5,000 I've ever received <laughs> because it costs so much time um, and anxiety and, and resources for that $5,000. I'm sure it actually um, cost me way more than $5,000 to administer that grant. And I had to buy a sign to put on the property that this, um, this was being funded in part by this CDBG funding, and I had to pay for the sign. <laughs> So it was crazy, um, and I, I said, if there, you really, so you really have to think about those funding sources and what the reporting requirements are going to be short term as well as long term. If you look at foundations, about 65% of nonprofits think that foundations are really the the reporting requirements are in proportion to the funding amounts received. 
Um, so I don't know if that's your experience, but this was um, from a survey. And then individuals, um, if you're capturing individual donations, um, individuals, again, pretty low reporting requirements. They expect um, a lot less than a federal government grant. And so, again, 80% of the revenue that's coming into nonprofits is coming from individuals as a whole. So if you have a high contributions from individuals, you won't spend as much time on all these reporting functions um, that you would with maybe government grants. So the third part of how we kind of got here in terms of this landscape, which is challenging to talk about um, the true cost of delivering on your mission, is the media. Um, and we often see stories, and I still read the Chicago Tribune, I like to get it in, in print. <laughs> um, we often see these stories, this one came up from the um, Wounded Warrior Project a couple of years ago now, looking at how much they were spending, revenue versus um, programs, and looking at other um, veteran charities, um, again, that were charities that the media loves to use, um, about, about their spending. So when there's a void of information, they rely on things like total revenue um, and total fundraising and those kinds of things. So they step into these things and try to imply that organizations are not doing as, are not as efficient or not as effective as other organizations. Um, so one of the things you'll often see pop up is this notion of how much cash on hand um, that organizations should have. Now, Wunder Project had about a year uh, worth of expenses in cash. So um, I understand that, that the public backlash against that was pretty strong and that's justified. Um, maybe a year is too much, but what's too little and where's the happy? We don't really have a standard. Um, I would say the literature says a minimum of three months cash on hand. I know that a lot of organizations do not have three months of cash on hand. I've done a lot of research, particularly in Illinois with Illinois nonprofits. Um, many of them are operating between 30 and 60 days um, cash, um, but there's still a significant portion that's operating with less than 30 days of cash on hand. So ideally, um, three to six months, a minimum of three, um, six months would be ideal. Once you get into that nine months and 12 months of cash, there's a perception of you. there's no need then. Um, you're, you don't actually need those funds um, to operate. So why are you constantly fundraising if you have nine to 12 months of cash on hand? So where is that uh, boundary? Um, when, is too, when is it too much? When is it too little? I would say foundations in particular are looking at those things. If you don't have enough cash, um, they think that you're more risky. If you have too much cash, they think that you're not needy. So that's that we're in this weird conundrum of uh, what is too little, what is too much. And I've, I've talked to people who make those fund decisions, and sometimes they will base their funding decisions in part on how much cash an organization has on hand. Now, in this current crisis, I'm sure that maybe those uh, thinking about those things that might actually loosen because organizations right now that are with six months of cash, they hopefully are panicking less. They have enough to sustain them for the next six months, dipping into reserves, and then they will build up those reserves um, after this particular crisis. And I think local governments um, do a better job at this. They have a targeted cash on hand reserve. Um, and yes, they will dip into that as they do. They know reserves are going to go up and down. Um, but they have a target and they try to stick to that target when they're making strategic decisions. I have not seen that happen with nonprofit organizations. I have not seen them state our target reserve is X, and we are going to try to be right around that uh, point at all time. And should there be a downturn, like now, we're going to use our reserves. That's what they're there for. They're strategic reserves to draw on and then build back up in times of excess. Um, so I would like to see more of that in the nonprofit sector. We don't have any guidance. This is not required by the IRS. Um, it's not a standard that you see circulated. It is something that we've researched and um, and in the literature and um, other researchers have indicated that really that minimum of three, ideally six, but you need to hold yourselves to that. That's the other struggle with nonprofit boards of trustees, board of directors. They actually have to hold themselves to those things. The other thing I will see crop up is this notion of CEO compensation, and often that falls into administrative overhead, is um, our CEOs making too much. And too much is uh, really arbitrary. This was floating on um, Facebook and there are other ones that float around saying how much is too much. So how much of each dollar contributed really goes to do good? Um, 
And it, you can see the percentages here, looking at how much um, these nonprofit organizations are perceived to make. And these are worthy charities, um, as determined by whoever. And whereas other charities across the bottom are not as worthy because they're spending those dollars on salaries. And as someone who teaches in the nonprofit space and has worked as a nonprofit executive director, CEO salary is not a direct um, is not a direct um, relationship to either efficiency or effectiveness. Um, the board has decided that that individual, because of their background, training, experience, um, size of budget, usually number of employees, um, num uh, area of specialization potentially, dictates a CEO salary. It's a market-based um, number. So if you want someone and the board decides they need a particular expertise, a particular educational qualifications, whatever that happens to be, and you're in Boston um, versus a rural suburb of Iowa, there's a cost to that. And so it's not directly related to efficiency or effectiveness. That's what happens when we don't, and when the nonprofit sector as a whole isn't really good about communicating our impact, that they rely on CEO compensation as a stand-in for efficiency or effectiveness, and it's not related um, at all. This was one that circulated um, a couple of years ago, and I've had my students do the same thing. Go into these organizations and tell me, um, do an evaluation, and would you give to these organizations based on what you know? And things like the CEO, again, we come back to CEO salary. It's one of those things that always pop up when you look at percentage spent on program costs. And I'll get into that of why that's a terrible um, a terrible indication. But just then it's looking at CEO salary in this slide and the other ones, there's no relationship at all to efficiency or effectiveness. Um, those are market-based board decisions, much like they are for any um, chief executive officer of any business. Um, depending on their background and skills, you're going to pay them a certain amount. So here's a list of our world's billionaires. We often talk about um, um, these individuals and others, and you might notice a little bit of a, not a little bit, a lot of a gender bias here. When we think about the world's billionaires, we put them on um, you know, the front covers of magazines and say how wonderful it is that they're all giving their money at such high levels, and the um, Bill Gates has been in the news recently during this virus and others of how much money he's donating. And then, but we, what we really know is that actually the poor are the most charitable. So no matter what we think of, the public's perception is that make a whole lot of money, everybody has to be a billionaire in order for them to contribute. And we actually know that as a giving as a percentage of income is actually highest among lower income individuals. And so we need to change that conversation. The people that are supporting us, the nonprofit sector, are not the top um, billionaires in the country. They're, they're everyday people. They're the nurses and the mechanics and the grocery store workers and teachers and all of those folks. Um, they're not the billionaires. And so we got to change the, a little bit of the conversation to move away from some of the lack of perception and understanding of how the nonprofit sector actually works. So next kind of section is getting to a little bit of um, related to CEO salary compensation is the, the challenge of leadership and HR challenges within the nonprofit sector. So we know that people who are drawn to the nonprofit sector have a very much a public service orientation. So similar to the folks that work in government, um, you do this because of the love of the people, because of wanting to make a difference, um, because of the mission. And whether that happens to be uh, cancer, whether that happens to be animals, whether that happens to be the environment, whatever it happens to be, um, it's a very mission-driven focus. Besides part-time jobs um, over the years in high school and, and my undergrad, um, I've only ever worked in public organizations, um, government first and then the nonprofit sector. So people like me know that those, that's the space that they want to be in. And that's the challenge sometimes for the nonprofit world. You have to find people who are very mission oriented, which is great. Um, the other unique challenge of nonprofit is that we use a lot of volunteers. We use a lot of volunteers for many reasons. Um, one is to engage, just engage the community into the mission. Two is to stretch those um, HR resources that we have. We can't pay to have all of the work done in our organizations because of resource constraints, so we use volunteers. But that means someone has to manage the volunteers. Um, somebody has to manage a workforce that is not compensated for that work, provides critical work for those organizations, and yet we have to manage them similar to many other employees. We have to deal with liability issues. We have to deal with hiring and firing and job descriptions and, and supervision and, and all of those things. Um, we also have a lot of project-based funding. As I said, if you rely on government grants, contracts, et cetera, 
you have projects that might last six months, that might last two years, that might last three years. So because of that, we have a definitely a more flexible workforce or necessary to have a flexible workforce, which can create challenges because we don't have a stable workforce necessarily all the time. Um, and then another area is recruitment. As uh, when, the, when the workforce was strong and we had very low unemployment, nonprofit organizations were definitely competing for employees and staff because there were so many other opportunities. Now as we've seen the unemployment go the other way, um, we will see more people potentially in the job market once the economy opens up. But when the economy opens up, will they all rush back into the for-profit sector? Or will we see potentially um, more opportunities for recruitment um, in the nonprofit sector? We don't. The other thing that I want you to be aware of is you're in nonprofit organizations. I hope that you've seen some of this um, occur in your organizations. The impact of university programs in nonprofit management, philanthropic studies, um, nonprofit administration, these programs really did not exist um, 20 years ago. And now we have huge proliferation, both um, non-credit as well as undergraduate and graduate education. And as a result, we have people now who are graduating, you know, with degrees, four-year degrees, and then including a master's, another two years degrees, that have this background and training in the nonprofit space, and they're moving into the nonprofit sector. Um, we, but we have people at the same time who are in that nonprofit sector who kind of rose through the ranks. These programs didn't exist potentially when they were in undergrad or in graduate school. And so their training is in content area specializations and not necessarily in administration and management. Um, and that, this is going to create an interesting dynamic in the nonprofit organizations themselves where you have potentially baby boomer um, CEOs who have maybe a background in education or social work, whatever it happens to be, and then you have this 25-year-old coming out with a master's degree in nonprofit management, and we're, we're going to have to see how that says they work themselves up into that space. Um, you also have the, the business schools at the same time. Um, some of them have nonprofit programs. Some are promoting that the business school programs are equivalent to a nonprofit management program. And so they're also competing with our nonprofit grads um, in your organization. So just something to be aware of if you're in a nonprofit space and you are, you know, researching job descriptions and hiring requirements and qualifications is to be aware of this large proliferation of nonprofit programs and to include those in your qualifications and really think through, do we need someone that has that context knowledge or do we need more of a technical expert um, just to kind of make you aware of what, what I see going on in that space. At the same time, that kind of how we got here is these, these community needs are still very high, and this crisis has certainly highlighted the, that these issues are there. We see a lot of inequity right now with the management of this COVID crisis that we're in, particularly around uh, in racial groups, minority groups. Um, African Americans here in, in Illinois are being particularly hit hard, both in the number of cases and the percentage of deaths that are occurring. So these critical needs are still very, very high. Um, so we have, we're graduating more. Um, more individuals with this background in nonprofit. Um, we have at the same time, oops, I'm just going to mute these. Um, at the same time, we have um, or, a proliferation of organizations. We have more organizations that are out there doing this good work, and yet those needs are still not being met to the, to the way they should be met when it comes to some of these social issues. So the UN has put out a number of sustainable, de sustainable development goals. Um, they created one in 2000 and again updated it. I love these goals. I think they're wonderful. I don't know if we are really infusing these goals and setting ourselves up to achieve these goals um, and for a number of different reasons that I'll get into when we, when we talk about kind of path forward. So this whole area of impact, as I said, it began in the late 80s, early 90s with the, the the public sector and now we certainly see it in the nonprofit sector and this is you'll see it in some of the language when it comes to uh, the releasing of grants community foundations family foundations government agencies are all calling for demonstrate your impact show your results demonstrate your impact um, and this does relate to our um, the nonprofit sector really underfunding a lot of the requirements to actually do this work so we can measure um, how much service we delivered. If you look in this, um, I think if I can get my pointer, if you look in this upper left hand corner, this is a lot of what we do. We measure effort. Um, we measure how much did we do last year? Um, how many people did we serve? For example, you'll often see those, <clears throat> those things being noted. So that means really how busy were we? You know, how much did we reach into the community? We sometimes will ask things <clears throat> around quality. 
how well did we deliver it? Um, what, uh, what's the outcome of some of those things? What change did we produce? And how much change did we produce? So thinking through what that really means for your organization is moving beyond this notion of how busy are we, how much effort did we put in, what are funders, what the public really wants to know, but we need to be able to answer is how well did we do it? What's the change that we actually produced? What's our social impact? This is a big area that's, that we see in the social entrepreneurship side, social enterprise, um, looking at what's the social impact? What's the return on investment? The larger donors in particular, major donors are looking at, how do I know my money is making a difference? That I'm not just dropping it into a black hole and you're doing the same old thing year after year that you've done with it. Um, tell me about the impact you're having in the world. So the path forward really I think is related to this last point of how do we move from this landscape of we need you to be we need you to be able to do everything um, we need we're restricting your resources we want you to show value we want you to show efficiency um, we're going to really call out things like high CEO salary or too much um, cash on hand how do we move ourselves away from this current landscape to really have much deeper richer and more informed decisions here's my um, my thoughts on this and I'm happy as we get to the closer to the end of the presentation that I'm, I welcome your thoughts and opinions about this but it really is a time to really rethink how nonprofits work um, how they can demonstrate um, their impact so I think for me it falls into a couple of these categories and I'm going to go through each of these so the path forward to me starts with humility um, first, and this is, um, you'll often hear doctors talk about the Hippocratic Oath, this is where it comes from. First, do no harm. So do we know that when a nonprofit goes into a community or serving a community that we're not doing more harm than what's actually there? It's not enough to do something. And sometimes I'll hear um, nonprofits say that, well, it's better to do something and nothing. Actually, sometimes it's not. <laughs> sometimes it's better if you don't do anything because you might actually be doing more harm because you haven't actually thought through what's the impact that I'm going to have on this community in the long term. And you'll see this sometimes with nonprofits and social enterprises that have set up themselves um, that we're going to, for every sale, we're going to do this. Um, Tom Shoes was an early adopter of this model. So for every pair of shoes, we're going to pair of shoes over here. And that has really disrupted local economies, particularly local businesses that have were created and and um, manufacture their own shoes and and employ local people it displaced a lot of that local economy so we have to remember first do no harm <laughs> be really clear on why you're doing it and the impact that you're going to have um winston churchill said sometimes doing your best isn't good enough sometimes we must required so if we know we're doing things and we, and we think we're serving a lot of people again not a good not a good measure um we're serving a bunch of people Maybe if we're not willing to do the hard work, we shouldn't be in there. We just shouldn't be in that space. Um, we need to maybe constrict our mission and really focus on what we're good at, focus in on uh, those things that we really have um, expertise in, that we can really demonstrate results, and get out of the things that we know we're not necessarily doing harm, but we're not doing good enough. We just haven't figured it out yet. The other thing is humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's, it's thinking of yourself less. It's not about you and you and the word of an organization. Nonprofits themselves do not need to exist in perpetuity. They do not need to be sustainable for here in the next thousand years. Um, we need to think it is about the people that we're serving. So if it's about the communities that you're serving, let's think about how we design programs that best serve them. And sometimes that's not us. That's not our nonprofit organization. That's best served by this organization or that's best served by government. And we need to do more on advocacy and policy to change that. Um, it's not about the organization. So I would challenge you when you think about um, what you're doing and why you're doing it, put yourselves with that community mindedness first. And it's not about the, the nonprofit part. So humility is not denying your, denying your strengths, but accepting your weaknesses. We know that the work that you're trying to do is very, very hard. Um, you might be working one-on-one -on -one with individuals who have um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, uh, sexual addiction, um, gambling addiction, whatever it happens to be, and you're trying to reduce that behavior, increase their knowledge, and change their condition over time. That is not simple work. For those of you who are in the, that space, particularly human services, that is not easy work. Now, we know that. 
So why do we create ourselves that we are going to set our standards up here or create these large missions that we know are not attainable, that we know is not possible given the resources that we have? Sometimes I try to talk a lot of people out of starting nonprofit organizations as much as I possibly can. <laughs> um, but when they do come to me, they're like, we are going to eliminate, um, we are going to, whatever it happens to be, a very, very large verb um, and we're going to do it well I'm not willing to quit my full-time job I have two volunteers and my sister's the ED um, but we know we can do this um, and I think they need to be much more humble in their expectations around their available resources their expertise um, those kinds of things to make them actually attack what the program is, the problem is know the problem what issue are you addressing you're not just creating a nonprofit organization's to create one it's a you have to go through all of the legal hoops to do it there's annual reporting requirements so what is the problem that you're actually addressing in your community how are you making that difference and how are you going to measure that over time to know if you're making that difference so accept that you have certain weaknesses any organization has certain weaknesses um, but know the data and make data informed decisions so what is your what does success look like for your organization and you need to have this conversation with your boards if we were to achieve our mission, what does that look like? Have those kind of really deep, meaningful discussions. How do we know we're successful? Is it testimonials? Is it surveys? Is it interviews? Is it measurable um, instruments that you've tested over time? What is it? How do we know when we've actually achieved success? What does it look like? And it does start with your mission. If you think about your mission, and I, I'll give you a couple of examples of good and bad missions, it starts there. How clear are they? So these are two examples that I sometimes will use about weak mission statements. If your mission statement looks anything close to this, you, it's time for an intervention. <laughs> uh, you need to get yourself in, in front of someone or a group and have this discussion of, because these are crazy. <laughs> these, are, these are put together probably by very smart, well-meaning people. Um, that got off track and it became about the organization. These are written from the organization's perspective. Here's what we're going to do to you, public, um, and you're going to take it, right? So we're going to conserve, improve, protect. We're going to collect, preserve, and interpret. It has nothing to do with you. And then by the end, they kind of get to some of the impact that they want to that they want to have in the world. Except it's huge: health, safety, well people, welfare of people, and their overall economic and social well-being. So as a researcher, I can tell you there is no perfect research um, that doesn't exist. There's always trade-offs. However, everything can be uh, everything can be researched and measured in certain ways, um, but it's not going to ever be perfect. But how would you ever possibly research the health? safety and welfare of people and their overall economic and social well-being over time to know that this organization is having that impact. They're not going to do it. I know they're not going to do it because it's expensive probably and it would take a long time. Same thing with the other um, one. So the top one is actually um, a, I want to say it's from New York State, it's a conservation authority. The bottom one, um, again one of my personal favorites of death by committee. Um, when you look at the wording of this is written in language no one's going to understand. Um, and it doesn't actually tell you what they're going to do. It, it kind of gets there at the end, like engage local and global audiences. I don't know how they would ever possibly measure that, but that was one of theirs. That's the Guggenheim. So start with the why. Why does your organization exist? Not the what or the how. If you can figure out the why, then you can you design the programs, the how around that why. So measure what matters. Sometimes nonprofit organizations, they can't see the forest for the trees necessarily. Someone wants to, in this case, give them some tools, increase their technology, um, invest in the database, um, get a more efficient um, you know, building location, whatever it happens to be. And nonprofits will often say, no, no, we're just too busy. We can't stop long enough to think about how could we improve this process to actually achieve our results better, more efficient, and have better outcomes for the people that we're serving. So you've probably seen these. I'll give you a couple of examples. These are like logic model ideas, theories of change, whatever you want to call it. You want to start at the impact you want to have in the world and then work backwards. And it seems that like this should be fairly straightforward, but I think what we often have is we have $200,000 for staff and we have a community that needs this. Now what do we build 
um, with those resources. So we sometimes will start at the other end instead of actually starting in the impact. So if you have your board members together, your, your staff, have those uh, conversations around what does impact look like? How do we know what success is? And then you build the organization backwards. That might mean you stop doing certain things. This is where you, we need strong leadership at the board level. It might mean we're not the best organization to provide fill in the blank, senior services, youth services, whatever it happens to be. So let's, we're gonna get out of that activity. But we are really good at doing this. We have really strong outcomes in these three key areas. That's where we need to focus our resources in because those are the impacts that we can demonstrate when we go out to the public. So what is your theory of change? What is your organization trying to accomplish? And then what are the strategies to get there? Do you have the capabilities to do it? Um, and how will your organization know if you're making any progress towards that? What have you accomplished so far and what's next? And this all really starts at the cultural level. So people to people in the leadership, the policies that you have, how you compensate people, et cetera, et cetera. Your culture, um, you have one, whether it's all written down and it's you know, really articulated. Every organization has a culture. And you know it if you've worked in more than one organization, how you would describe your culture. This culture is this way. This nonprofit operates in that way. So you really need to change the cultural mindset of organizations to be focused on what are we here for? What are we trying to do? What data do we have? How are we going to get those things? If you're, if you're a culture that is always in crisis or a culture that is always, well, we don't have this. If we just had money, we could do this. Our board is terrible. We don't have the right staff. Um, we're not in the right location. There's a, there, those do exist at certain nonprofits where they're always in a deficit kind of mindset. We don't have enough of something to achieve what we want it to do. You can really shape the culture. If you're in a leadership position or even if you're not, the, everybody contributes to that culture. So how do you express that culture when it comes to making some of these changes? That's really where it has to start. It's not a top-down thing. It's not a bottom-up thing. It is everything around you. So looking at all of the things that really contribute to culture in this work. I mentioned this quote because I, when I teach uh, philanthropy and fundraising, I often start with this. Philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice. So yes, some of us are operating in a space that there are chronic in social injustices that necessitate this work because we have not fixed the chronic things. So as an organization, what are you doing to get to those underlying concerns? If you're in a food um, distribution or food pantry or anything related to food insecurity. Your organization also has to be looking at what causes people to be hungry, what causes people to not have enough food, what causes this economic circumstance where they have to come to food pantries and food kitchens. That is part of your mission if you're going to be addressing that particular aspect. It's not enough to just continue to keep serving and keep serving and keep serving. We've got to look at those underlying injustices. And I think this particular crisis has really highlighted those things are not going away. No matter how much we talk about how many pounds of food we've delivered, how many individuals we served, unless we start chipping away at the basis for a lot of that injustice, we are never going to make headway on those big um, issues that are facing our community. So know your true cost, as I mentioned. Don't sign any contract unless you know up front what you actually have to contribute to make this contract work. What is the actual cost of doing anything? And then figure out what, you're, what you are willing to live with. What is your ability to assume those indirect costs on yourself? So what am I, what am I committing to? If I'm going to get a $100,000 contract and I know it's going to cost me $150,000, I've got to make up that $50,000 somewhere. Those are conversations at that high level you should be having with your board. It's not enough to say, and this happened when I was an ED, it tends to happen when you get good at something, you just, they say, oh, well, that's great. Now go find three more of those things, whatever it happens to be. So say you're really good at grants. You're really good at researching. You're a really good writer, all of those things. There needs to be a discussion, though, that, again, grants typically do not cover all of your costs. So if we go after, if we pursue a true grant funding model for our organization, and we're not going to be outward focused on individual and major gifts, we're going to be internal. We're going to be writing grants and do accounting and reporting. Those are two different revenue strategies. And so what are we giving up? Where are we going to make up those differences? Fundraising and all of you are, a lot of you on the phone or, or online are fundraising, fundraising experts. Um, you know there's a cost 
to fundraising efforts. And typically individual fundraising, there's a long-term investment there that doesn't happen overnight. You need 18 months, 24 months, 36 months to see some true um, you know, reality of all that work that you're working on. It isn't a switch that you turn off and on. So if you don't get this grant this year, you can't go find 100,000 from donors if you haven't cultivated them for the last 18 months. It just doesn't happen. So we need to have those true, uh, honest conversations with our board and leadership when we look at um, grants. So it takes money to make money. This probably is, again, is not news to anyone that's on the line, but it does take money to make money. If you look at businesses in particular, where they're investing research and development, where they're investing in marketing and advertising, it takes money to make money. Fundraisers are the sales force of organizations. You don't cut your sales force and expect your revenue to go up, right? You need a fundraising team in order to show results on fundraising. Again, it takes long term. This isn't something where you turn your fundraisers loose one day and the next day they show up with bags of money. That's not how it works. Um, it is a long term effort, but it does take money to, to make money. And you, you need to have those conversations with the leadership to kind of turn those conversations around. The other thing I want to remark here is just to kind of keep it in the back of your mind because I think nonprofits, as much as they are definitely committed to serving individuals, some of our lowest income, um, some of our um, you know most sensitive populations, vulnerable populations, there's also nonprofits out there that are underpaying their own staff. Um, when crisis hit, and we know this happened in the last state budget crisis, nonprofit staff are often the first to suffer, whether that's furloughs. Um, whether that's layoffs, whether that's uh, wage cuts, whatever it happens to be. So going back to your culture, going back to your mission, you have to treat the individuals in your organization as much as you would treat the public that you're serving. You cannot serve the, the, the public out there that's uh, maybe lower income and perpetu perpetuate that, that low income wage earner in your organizations. Those are leadership value kinds of questions that your board has to have. Um, and I think that's really important to get us out of this mindset that the people who work in nonprofits either make nothing, which I sometimes hear, <laughs> or they shouldn't really make anything anyway because they're working in a nonprofit. I hope that my students that come out with bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in nonprofit management and nonprofit studies will earn a living wage and be able to pay off student loans and be able to post one day and whatever there happen to be uh, their financial goals. I, that's what I want for them. That's what they've worked hard to achieve. So we have to change the mindset that nonprofit organizations should pay their employees much less, should not value that expertise. Um, we, we need to have those conversations with our boards. So another piece of this is donor and public education. We have donors and the public who do not understand what we do and how we do it. They don't understand what it costs to run organizations. They don't understand that the reporting requirements for a state-funded grant require me to have CPA audits, and they require quarterly financial statements. Um, somebody has to pay for that. And when we accept grants, that, that's part of it. So we have to educate our donors on true costs and get away from this mindset of program delivery is everything. Every dollar must go to program. Every dollar is going to your organization and it funds things across the board. We don't want them to um, make the assumption just because you give it to us, we're going to guarantee 97 cents in the dollar is going to um, programs or we're going to restrict it to only programs and not be able to pay for things like internet provision, which is crazy. So we need to break these bad habits of talking about, negatively talking about um, low administrative costs. So don't promote these things on your website. Don't promote these things on any of your materials like annual reports. 97% of every dollar goes here. Um, we need to break those habits of talking about our work like as if it's um, you know a yard sale that you're going to get the best deal if you give us 97 cents versus that other organization who spends a whopping 92 cents on, on programs, whatever it happens to be. So we have to break our own bad habits so that the media and the general public start to get more educated on these issues. And we can do this in several ways. Um, we need to certainly be more transparent and accountability be, and accountable because if we don't, the public's going to come, come um, and get the information that they're able to access and analyze that um, information in a way that's not always appropriate, and especially with the media. So we can do a better job. We shouldn't rely on just the required um, documents like IRS 990s or financial statements or whatever, we need to think about telling our own story in a better way. So I often have students go out and 
and survey nonprofit websites to say what are they saying about their impact. And I will tell you, not much. Um, sometimes we'll look in their annual reports and it's not there. Sometimes we will look for things like impact or performance measures or um, strategic plans, anything that has something in it that they're trying to achieve so we know that there's some goal setting and there is nothing on their websites. Now that doesn't mean that they're not doing it internally, but those things need to be made more public. Um, your audited financial statements, your IRS 990s, all of those should be easily accessible on your website. Don't send them to a third party organization like GuideStar to create a free account to get to your 990s. My, my goal, which I always talk about, a minimum of five years of IRS 990s should be on your website. Otherwise, you're making somebody work for it. As soon as you make somebody work for it, that's going to create that, well, what are they trying to hide? What are they trying to do? How come they're not giving me that information? Why are they sending me to a third party website in order to put it up there? There's no excuse for not putting PDF forms um, on your website. There's not a storage issue. There's nothing other than um, you don't want people to have access to it. And as soon as you do that, that means that there's some suspicion there of what you're trying to do or what you're trying to get away with. So IRS 990s at a minimum, make them available on your website. Same with your annual financial information returns to the state. Yes, we know we can go to the attorney general's site and get those documents. Why make it hard? Put them on your website. Um, I would say go to GuideStar and create your profiles. Edit those profiles so you get to tell your story. That's another area where you can tell your story about what your program objectives are. Give information about your, um, your boards of directors, your contact information, your financial information, whatever it happens to be. These, these seals of transparency that they have, we, there's been research on this that those things do matter for fundraising, especially when you don't have any seal and then you achieve a seal. There's a big jump um, in terms of your, an organization's, um, it's a trust issue, right? It's trust and accountability issue. So we know that there is research to say there is a fundraising bump with achieving those seals. And those are things that are within your control. To earn those seals, you get information and, and go through basically a checklist to earn those things. Charity Navigator on the other side, they evaluate you. You don't go in and, um, and create your profiles. But if you can get um, Charity Navigator rated, that also, um, also helps because not a lot of people want to read financial statements. <laughs> so these are some ways that we can um, make it easier for people to find information about us. So use your website, use your annual reports to tell your own story, to tell your impact, to be as honest and transparent as you can be so that we don't, we can change the culture around what nonprofit organizations do and how they do it. I would suggest you always sign up for National Council of Nonprofits. That's our national um, nonprofit association. In Illinois, we have Forefront, um, Independent Sector, and Nonprofit Finance Fund. These are four really good um, organizations to follow, whether on social media, online. Um, all of them send out alerts on a monthly basis or sometimes weekly basis. So you stay up to date. National Council of Nonprofits has done a lot during this COVID crisis with um, what the impact of all of the federal legislature means for nonprofits. They've been doing webinars and all that stuff. So certainly follow the National Council. I know many of you work in very niche kind of areas, whether that's social services or arts and culture, and you're probably pretty into those, like what I would call them subsectors. But we have to think as a sector, we need to act more cohesively as a whole. So try to plug into those larger conversations that's happening about the entire sector if possible. So what do I think are the key takeaways from all of this stuff? Because, I, again, I could go on and on. <laughs> I love this stuff. Um, so there are two things when you look at um, administrative capacity. And I don't, I don't like the words overhead, but say your administrative capacity. What we're actually finding is um, people are, one, actually underinvesting in administrative capacity, such as maybe technology or data analysis, which is hampering effectiveness and efficiency. So they're actually purposely saying, no, I need to, you know, pay for, because I can get a grant, I'm going to pay for one more program person, whether that's a counselor or a teacher or whatever happens to be, instead of investing in technology and data analysis. So they're, they're actually, you know, hampering their efforts to achieve those missions. So they're actually underinvesting and underinvesting. On the other side, we're also just, and some organizations are doing this, underreporting. So we're just using those 990s and putting, allocating those resources into admin fundraising and, um, and program, we're making those up because there's actually not a, there's really no way you could um, allocate those resources um, across in the 990 with any kind of deliberation or research because you'd have to do, most all of those costs are salaries 
and they're usually salaries that split out across one individual. So if you're the um, CEO or uh, executive director, you take your salary and you split it across. So given what we know of all that um, all that came out in the 90s and into the 2000s around um, GuideStar and Charity Navigator saying too much overhead, whatever, and they, they know they were getting that data from 990s. So or nonprofits at best are guessing, because you have to, unless you want to do time studies, um, or you're making it up, right? You're lying. <laughs> so people that are actually underreporting, that again, perpetuates that myth that administration capa administrative capacity is wrong, administrative capacity is extra, administrative capacity does not actually meet mission. So it continues to perpetuate that myth. Um, third, we need to educate boards and donors. That's really key to changing the mindset, to focus on the impact that you're having and not program percentages. Get away from talking about program percentages. Um, if people ask you about it, have something uh, ready to go that, you know, what we do um, includes all of our costs because we think that investing in technology and investing in our, our sales force being our fundraisers, long term we've seen really strong growth and that's what's really driving our program efforts. That's what's leading us to have better outcomes. But we need to have those conversations with boards and donors. So focus on impact requires evidence that you are actually making a difference. Thinking about how you're using data, evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, not just numbers. And we need to move beyond measuring activity. So move beyond measuring just how busy we are and how many people we're serving. Um, five, impact requires a very focused mission. What impact do you want to achieve? And having humility in your expectations. We are trying to change um, people's behavior, um, attitudes, their condition, and their knowledge. And that's how I remember it is B-A-C-K. So if you're trying to change those four things, you need to be really humble in, in actually being able to do it. So I teach. I love teaching. Um, I try to, I hope that I'm changing knowledge over time and I'm measuring that potentially with assignments and tests and exams. That's only knowledge though. Um, you can go in and tell people, here's what you sh should stop doing. You know what? We need to, um, you'll see it in, in certain states where we put up calorie counts, whether that's at Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or whatever. We're trying to improve people's knowledge of, yes, high fats are bad for you. Yes, um, high sugar is bad for you, whatever that happens to be. Are we really going to change behavior and attitudes? Or are we just in increasing knowledge? Can somebody say, yes, I know having those French fries is 250 calories, and that's probably not a great use of 250 calories. Is that enough? In your organizations, the people that go through your programs, is that enough to increase their knowledge? Or what are you really trying to do is change their behaviors and attitudes? Behaviors and attitudes are not easy to change. So what are our expectations around behavior and attitudes? How many people that actually go through our programs will actually stop doing something that's harmful or start doing something that's positive as soon as the program ends, six months out, two years out? What data do we have that actually can show that? And if we don't have the data, what data could we get? How can we get that data that actually provides that evidence? So be really humble in your expectations because many of you are trying to do very, very hard things. That doesn't mean that we should say it's not a success if two people complete your program and go on to do whatever, change their behavior and go on and improve their social condition, that they're able to live sustainably and, and not be in public assistance, whatever it happens to be. Those should be celebrated. But let's be truly honest with the organizations that we're in about our expectations. Number six, organizations don't need to be sustained or to exist in perpetuity. You have to have those conversations. There are some organizations that are not as effective as they could be. By virtue of existing, and you know, I really want to make this clear, by virtue of existing, every nonprofit organization is being subsidized by the rest of us. So if you have an organization that exists and it's not one that relates to you, it's not an organization you've ever donated to, by virtue of them existing, the rest of us have to subsidize that organization because they are not paying income tax, they are not paying sales tax, they are likely not paying property tax. The rest of us have to subsidize every single nonprofit that's created in this country if you're a taxpayer. So think about that and that responsibility. Um, those organizations do not need to be sustained or exist in perpetuity. It's not about the organization. It's about improving people's condition. Seven organizations need to embrace transparency. Justification for investments. What are you doing with your donation dollars? Um, where are your financial statements? Can I get to them? Organizations can create summary financial statements, and I challenge all of you to do this. For people that don't like a lot of numbers, financial audits and, and 990s, 
do summary sheets, a couple of pie charts. Um, how are you doing over time? I like five-year trend lines, not just year over year like you see in financial statements. So five-year trend. Are so revenues going up or down? Um, is our investments, endowments, um, et cetera. So use the financial statements, but also create some really compelling visuals that help people understand your financial position, but also your efficient. So that's on the efficiency side. And then think about what can, how can we better tell our story on the effectiveness side? Um, eight different stages of an organization requires different investments of administrative capacity. If you're a startup, you're going to have high investments potentially in technology or high investments in staff training, whatever it happens to be. If you're an organization that's maybe been around a long time and you're um, shifted your focus or you've narrowed your focus, whatever that happens to be, those things need to change over time. And you've got to communicate that to your donors and to uh, the people who, who are making those investments. There's only so much philanthropic dollars to go around. So you want to give them as much information as you can to make those decisions. Uh, nine, again, know the true cost of your program. So you have justification for funding requests. Ask for full coverage of all those uh, dollars to cover your programs, not just your direct costs, because you're paying for those in other ways. You have to, you're making up the difference in, in fundraising or use of volunteers. So let's be really honest and open about what those funding um, requests should be. 10, evaluate your organization's financial goals and policies to align with your values, level of risk, revenue diversification, cash reserves, et cetera. Have these things written down um, and have a discussion with the leadership, both the board and the staff. This is what we're comfortable with. I know organizations that are not comfortable having less than nine months of cash on hand for situations like we're in right now. I also know organizations that are highly risky. They have lots of bank lines of credit. Um, there was a, an arts and culture organization, this was years ago, an arts and culture organization, they tend to earn all of their revenue um, in very, basically two times a year for this organization. So between those two shows, they would really dip in revenues and they would have to take out, you know, extend their bank lines during the summer, for example, when they didn't have any shows. So every organization is going to be different. Your cash flow is just as important sometimes as your as your cash on hand, you know, that's in the bank, but the, that's earmarked that you can't actually spend. Your cash flow is even more critical, especially at a time right now where you're still trying to make payroll, pay for certain things. Um, so have those policies and procedures written down based on your organization's values, um, based on your level of risk and, and your the population that you're serving. So those are my kind of top 10, I would say, takeaways. Um, two books that I'll recommend as we're wrapping up, Nonprofit Sustainability, Making Strategic Decisions for Financial Viability. That's a lot on the, um, on the efficiency side, I would say, on the, on the financial side, but also thinking through your capacity issues, the other book, um, Building Nonprofit Capacity Around Organizational Life Cycles. So um, organizations go through the same thing, you know, startups new uh, to teenagehood to adulthood and to maturity those are very clear cycles in in our human experience but they're also very true for nonprofits so if you're in a startup and everything seems kind of all over the place and nothing is written down you're making things up as you go that's exactly what a kid is doing right that that early childhood um, teenagehood there's a lot of angst um, should I go in this direction? Should I go in this direction? So if you've been around between, um, you know, 12 to 18 years, you're in that teenagehood, that's where you're at. You're being pulled in different directions. You're not sure that's that way forward. And then around year 25, things have kind of settled down and you're trying to, you really focused your energy. So I, I really enjoy these two books and I highly recommend them as you go forward. I'm going to leave my contact information up um, there so you guys can um, can have that, but I'm happy to take some questions now. So you can, if you go to the middle of the bottom of the screen, you can raise your hand if you want to talk, which is fine, or you can put something into the chat and I will respond there. Okay, so Mike has a question. Um, if nearly 100% of nonprofits survive the state budget crisis, what percent do you see predicting in 2021? Will we see higher employee churn due to fear? Um, I think it depends on how long this crisis lasts. As I said, I think most nonprofit organizations operate with 30 to 60 days of cash. So if they have 30 to 60 days and they're willing to spend down some of that reserves, um, I don't think we're going to see um, a bigger crisis than we had in the state budget issue. However, if this particular crisis goes on beyond 30 to 60 days, they've exhausted their cash reserves, they've already furloughed, um, they've done all of the, the easy things that they could do initially, then I think we're going to start to see closures. 
Um, you know, and, I, and I'll note, um, mergers happen. Uh, they don't happen very often in the nonprofit sector, um, typically hospitals, but uh, they don't really happen for um, kind of more general purpose nonprofits. And that's because mergers only happen when they're both typically strong. It's, it's very rare where a strong nonprofit wants to take on a weaker partner. It's usually a strong, strong kind of thing. So I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of mergers, particularly right now. Um, when it comes to high employee churn due to fear, it's probably dependent on what kind of nonprofit you are. I think your direct service workers, so the people who work with seniors or um, the people who work with um, low-income people who have experienced already higher rates of infection, um, that will certainly be a challenge. We have seen that already in some of the nursing homes where they're losing employees, uh, particularly the lower paid employees, the, the home support specialists, the people that are working directly in those nursing homes. I think that will continue to be a challenge. Um, on the positive side, it may result in people actually um, you know, thinking through that those positions are actually highly valued and deserve more um, salary as we go forward, which will actually drive more people into those uh, opportunities. So on the plus side, I think that that could be a positive outcome. Um, so Lori asked, crises can often increase giving, but this one is also ha impacting individuals on a broader spectrum. Do you anticipate increase or decrease giving over the long term and short term overall following the global pandemic? Um, I think um, the individuals who are less affected, and I will say the middle to upper income, are faring much better in this crisis because they are already in positions where they can work at home. Um, they're not necessarily going to lose their jobs in this first round. Um, so I think it could increase individual giving from our middle to upper income earners as long as we're not in this too long, that they're also worried about their long-term economic impact. Um, so I can see those populations um, increasing over time. If you are keeping in touch with your donors, and I'm sure all of you are, I would definitely reach out to them um, throughout this crisis and explain, you know, what's going on and, and engage them in your mission. Um, I think we could see a, a bump there. I know that some of the work that's going on in the federal government to ease restrictions when it comes to uh, charitable giving, um, things that are coming out through the tax code that you can uh, not itemize and still get charitable contributions for, I think it was $300 for this year, whatever that happens to be. Um, that's an incentive and it might help some people. Most people don't give because they get tax incentives to give. Um, so that's something to watch as well. Um, Maureen, what other ideas do you have on how we could educate donors and the public about true costs and counteract the overhead myth, both as individual organizations and as a sector? Um, I think, so first you have to start out in your own organizations. Do, do your organizations and staff understand what are the true costs of your programs? So that's where you have to start. Um, and I don't think many organizations are are really good at knowing what those true costs are and what actually goes into them. And I know this because organizations, and you guys are fundraisers, so I can say this, <laughs> organizations will often um, turn to fundraising events, special events, as a way to, um, to solidify some of their funding. And overall, fundraising events are probably one of the worst ways to make money in the short term because they are so costly in time. Time of staff, uh, volunteer time, which has a true cost, um, support time for um, carrying all those things out. So I know that organizations are not as good as understanding what their indirect costs are because I've seen it when they are putting together fundraising events. I looked at, I think it was the um, the Smithsonian Museums in Washington. I pulled it for a student class, so I think it was last year, and the Smithsonian, who has you know some of the best physical resources in the world, um, best spaces, they've been around forever. You'd think they had figured out fundraising costs, and their fundraising events two years ago lost three hundred thousand dollars. So net, they lost three hundred thousand dollars. They were showing a negative income for for fundraising events. Um, so I don't think we that organizations always understand how do we calculate those true costs. Um, once those are um, are calculated. I think those are things that show up in one-on-one -on -one conversations with donors. It's not necessarily something that you um, you make public, although you certainly could. You know, it, it costs us um, seven dollars to do X to uh, provide food, provide service, whatever it happens to be, and then to have the data to back those things up. I don't think that's a bad thing to start communicating that to the public of what the true costs are. Um, and where the gap is. So where your funding comes in from government, 
where's the gap? How much dollars? And I've seen this because um, some of my kids go to Catholic schools and we're often, um, it'll often say, okay, your tuition dollars cover this. And NIU has done this too. Your tuition dollars actually cover this. Here's the difference in what you're actually paying for this good or service. And here's where those dollars come from in order to, for us to provide those services. I'd like to see more of that um, visually, ideally, um, so that they're quick and easy to understand. So here's the dollars that we get to provide the service. Here's the difference. And here's where we're making those dollars, those dollars up. Um, any other questions or comments? We're at 9.56. How about that? <laughs> we have like two more minutes. Um, Kathy had a question. Oh, can you elaborate on the slide which showed that a large percent of indiv individual donations never or rarely cover overhead expenses? Wouldn't most individual donations be unrestricted? Um, I think most of them are unrestricted, yes. I'd have to dig through to see where I got the slide to give you the source. Um, but I think there are certain individuals that still restrict dollars based on their program interests. Um, so I think that's part of what's going on with that slide, that um, when we fundraise, when we're out there in the community and we say, you know, we're fundraising for our after school program, um, you might be boxing yourself in because now you can only spend it on um, after school programs and you really want them to come in unrestricted. What is, what's um, interesting for me to see over this next little while is you've probably seen the um, Giving Tuesday Now uh, that's coming up next month. Uh, to for organizations to be able to do online giving for Give Tuesday, those dollars should be coming in unrestricted so they can go where they need to go. But how that gets communicated uh, by the organizations, I guess that's up to them if they decide to allocate those things. So, um, Kathy, if you want me to check the source of those slides, just shoot me an email and I'll look for it. But those are some of my initial reactions to that. As I said before, we are um, recording and I will provide slides, so I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.